Hello, everyone, and welcome back to season four of the SPEMA Council podcast. My name is Madeline Grassi, and I am one of your co-hosts, um, as well as the podcast administrator for this season. On the hosting side today, I have Jackson Pretley joining me, who is our producer and also co-host this year. And I'm going to throw it over to Jackson to now introduce our guest on the podcast today. Thank you, Marilyn. So on today's episode, we are joined by George Dudas, who is the Director of Global Partnerships at the National Hockey League and is also a course instructor at Brock University. George started his journey working for Anheuser-Busch and Bev and has since moved through roles at the NBA, NFL, and is now currently at the NHL. Most of George's experience lies within the marketing and sponsorship stream, having led fan and sponsorship engagement, including delivering some big name deals with tier one brands in the sport industry. George graduated from Queen's University with a Bachelor of Physical Education and then went on to earn his Master's of Sport Management from Temple University. We're happy to welcome as our fourth guest of season four on the SPEMA Council podcast. Little round of applause. <laughs> welcome, Thank George. you for having me. <laughs> So, George, our first question is, how did you find your path in the sport industry? Because as I mentioned, you graduated with a Bachelor of Physical Education from Queens. Like, how did you find your role with within the sport industry? Well, it feels like a long time ago now. But uh, tell you, we you know, I spent a lot of years in the, in the service industry, working as a bartender, as a waiter. And I'm sure probably similar to a lot of the roles that uh, many of students are going through right now to get themselves through school and to make some money for the things that are important to them. But uh I made the conscious decision to move to Toronto. Uh, I took a role managing a restaurant actually in downtown Toronto. So I could just get here, kind of the epicenter of, you know, Canadian business and Canadian sports. I mean, this is a long time ago now. And, you know, obviously, you know, things have grown and, and programs have grown and sports as a whole and the country has grown, but it got me a whole lot closer to the action. And, uh, you know, I, I was lucky enough to meet some really unique people. I put myself out there, uh, especially working in a busy restaurant. That didn't hurt. Um, but uh, I put myself out there and got to meet a lot of people. Um, I was given some really great advice that at some point in time, you know, you need to get some some legitimate sales experience, which will help your career, um, which I took to heart. You know, disappointing at the time when you hear all the great things you're doing as a restaurant manager and managing people and problems and inventory and cash flow and schedules and problem issues, objections, things like that, that people just don't recognize, you know, you had to work harder to try and do that. So I got into the sales business. I got a role working with Anheuser-Busch, uh, Labatt Breweries, basically here in Canada. And uh, I got some great exposure. I, uh, I worked as a sales rep for three years, kind of managing my own territory and my own business, trying to sell to restaurants and bars and working with LCBO and the beer store. And uh, it set me up for some great success. And, and uh, I got what I wanted in getting promoted. I ended up moving into the marketing department, working on a brand called Bex, which is a German brand that, uh, that ADI ended up buying um, and took a lot of priority. And uh, Bex was an F1 sponsor. They owned the Jaguar, sponsor the Jaguar racing team. And uh, knowing we have a race in Montreal every year that that was step one in my sponsorship journey and how to activate a sponsorship and take something that was unique and make it work. And uh, subsequently got the opportunity with some promotions on, the, on Budweiser, working on NASCAR and NFL and rodeo uh, to Bud Light, which uh, we transitioned to NHL hockey from Labatt Blue. So all that considered gave me some really great background on the, uh, on, on how to utilize sponsorship as a brand. And uh on the side of that, I was trying to build my my own brand, and uh, you know, as, as is important to everyone, that um, I was trying to find some experiences that would help kind of build my resume. So, luckily enough, I met some people and an individual that worked for the NBA out of New York, and uh, who brought me on as a volunteer, uh, working NBA All Star in Phoenix, and uh, I got another opportunity to do that the year after um, in San Antonio, and then. Uh, after that, it became another 11 years of fully paid contract working in player operations for every All-Star game and, and gave me the opportunity to go to China twice with the global games. So, um, you know, without reaching out and doing something like that and, and not finding other experiences like the Goodwill Games is something I, I did some work on for years at kind of going out of your comfort zone, putting yourself out there to try and get some experiences. And that absolutely helped me uh, kind of get down the path and, uh, you know, I turned uh, a lot of those experiences into a sales and business development role at the NBA for two years and then subsequently the NFL for four and then now 
the NHL for eight. So uh, again, I'm a very fortunate guy, but I like to think you make your own luck. Um, and, you know, you, you've got to keep doing things to try and differentiate yourself versus other people. You know, a lot of people out there looking for a sports job. So you got to find those unique things and unique opportunities to do something different than everybody else that you can talk about on a resume or an interview. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and you touched on a lot of points there that we're told almost every day. Uh, but as FEMA students, you know, like network, do get as many experiences as you can, say yes to opportunities, build your personal brand. So it's it's nice to see somebody who's who's been successful but is also saying the same things because you you've done them yourself and and that's where that's a spot you can end up in um so Absolutely. pretty awesome yeah um moving on here so as as we've heard you've worked for three out of the big um four sports those being the nba the nfl the nhl and the mlb um what is your greatest memory or achievement in, in doing so so far well, you know, I mean, there's so many, I'm so lucky. I, you know, I'd say, you know, some of the things I touched on originally, I'd say, you know, with regards to memories, you know, I've been lucky to go to a lot of great events and, and see a lot of great places that I probably wouldn't have been able to do if I wasn't working in those roles. So, you know, the ability to go to China, the ability to go to all these fantastic places for all-star games and outdoor hockey games and, and, um, and award shows and things like that, that are just, you know, second to none. Uh, those are experiences that are that would live with me uh, forever. I mean, most notably, I mean, I went to China and I went up the Great Wall of China with the Golden State Warriors. So, you know, I think that was a really, you know, something I didn't plan on and just happened and just incredible to to have an experience like that. You know, with regards to achievement, you know, I'd say I think I'm most proud of just having some longevity and being able to stay in the business and deliver results long enough. To, to keep me around, you know, I, I mean, I'm lucky to do that with three different sports leagues that, you know, ultimately have different goals and aspirations and, and objectives. Um, and, you know, to work with three of the greatest sports leagues in the world, like and thought leaders, uh, and some of the people like are some of the premier people in sports, like, or have gone on to do some really incredible things in sports. You know, I, I, I just learned from the best. I got a chance to evolve as a sponsorship sales and marketing professional. You know, and, uh, and, you know, as a result, like there's a ton of achievements I could probably turn to, but most notably like that I just got exposure to a whole bunch of really awesome people who, who have changed the landscape of sports and uh, who continue to do that on a day-to-day -day basis. No, for sure. I mean, we always hear about like network yourself. You're going to meet so many cool people, like go work here, go work there. Cause you never know who you're going to meet and like the connections you're going to meet as well. So I think Absolutely. you made a really good point there. So um, just a, I kind of like a one kind of current question. Um, the NHL uh, just released what they're going to do with like the boards and like that type of partnership. So um, if you can touch on it, I'm not sure how much you're allowed to say. So um, can you just like maybe talk about like the process behind that, how you guys came up with the idea, and, like how it was like to kind of like try and sell that idea to like potential sponsors as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, for those that may not be familiar, we're, and it's public now. So this is something that absolutely we're happy to chat about. And we've been trying to sell for a little while, but uh, for people who are going to start watching hockey games as of this next week, when the season starts, you're going to notice something really different in, in the game when you're watching from home. Um, and that's going to be the the rink boards are going to change in their appearance, meaning that you're going to see brands taking over big portions of rink boards. And what we call that is called digitally enhanced dasher boards or what we call to this acronym is DDB and basically taking rink boards and in you know layman's terms turning them into green screen and allowing brands to have greater notoriety to actually have some motion and debt and animation in it to actually tell a brand story to call people to action to do something way more impactful than maybe a traditional rink board did as a logo that you hope to see during the game if you're in a stadium you're still going to see that uh, but if you're at home you know, about 80 or 85 percent of the, the NHL game is, is shot from the center ice camera. And when we are using that camera is when you're going to start seeing those boards and you're going to start seeing brands taking advantage of this in a in a way that's never really been done. Well, so it has been done. World Cup of Hockey is a first test in 2016. We've been working on this for about six years. And uh, the unique thing is, is not only you're going to see it, but 
as a fan of the game, you're going to start to see like more relevant, more contextual messaging to you. So instead of watching the Leafs play in Florida and see an advertisement for the South Florida Botox Hospital or Miami-Dade County Hospital or whatever it happens to be, that at the end of the day, you're going to start to be able to see Canadian relevant messaging. You'll see Canadian Tire, Scotiabank. You'll see all the brands that actually play in Canada that actually have a role that you're not normally seeing or haven't seen in the past in those away games that the, the clubs are doing. So we're doing this in conjunction with the clubs. Uh, the clubs are going to be able to sell their own regional games. And then on national games, uh, they will also be able to sell. Uh, and then we'll have a, a little role in that during the season and probably more so in the playoffs. But it's a really great, unique opportunity. It's an innovation that we're really proud of. It's changing the landscape from an advertising perspective and for our partners who want to reach hockey fans and tell a story. And uh, it's going to actually serve you know, a lot of our needs. You know, I think with COVID, um, this probably, you know, it's been expedited, but I mean, let's be honest. I mean, COVID, I think, has forced us to expedite a lot of different things that are bringing notoriety to the game to try and make sure we have that engagement and and, uh, and participation from our sponsors and from fans. So, yeah, new and innovative and uh, will definitely change the landscape. And, you know, as I moved through my class, I asked last night, the uh, sports sponsorship class, how many people liked it. And uh, when I show it a little brief piece of it, and it's funny, it's going to take a little getting used to. So I'll, I'll be interested in the feedback after a couple of weeks on how people feel about, uh, about it and, and if it's impactful. No, for sure. I mean, cause I even like, I'm in, I'm in that class as well. So I even saw that little clip yesterday. I think I was one of the few hands that didn't mind it. Like I thought it was a good idea. I thought it was like an innovative idea to try the NHL has to try some stuff, some new stuff. Like you always got to try new, like new ideas, see what works, see what doesn't work. And, I think it's a good idea, especially I know the biggest thing we talked about last night was like it could be distracting. So um, as long as it's done, like not as in a distracting way, I think it's a great idea to be able to rotate sponsorships as well. There's a lot of a, a lot of potential with it, but we're going to, as I mentioned last night, we're going to walk before we run. We're going to try and do this somewhat seamlessly. So it's not it doesn't take away from how much you enjoy the game and what you're seeing in the game. It's complimentary. And it looks kind of looks and feels similarly to what ring boards were before with floating white and and, uh, and space. But at the end of the day, it's definitely a game changer and will be something unique and different. And listen, we're sensitive to it. We want to make sure our fans like it, that our fans like we know that there's impact involved with it. And that's something we're also going to measure. Uh, but we're conscious of ensuring that the fan uh, can can absorb you know, all this new stuff along with managing their enjoyment of the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think when when for myself, especially when I chose the sport management program, I had an interest in sport. I went to a sport focused high school. I like being around like minded people. So I thought, you know, Brock Spima sounds pretty cool. I know it's it's pretty good program. I, I think I'd thrive here. And now being in our, my third year, I noticed that I used to go to leaf games and sports games with my dad and my family and just enjoy being a fan. And I would just love being there and the atmosphere. But now as a third year student, I, I go to these games. We went to the Heritage Classic last year in Hamilton. And I remember right. sitting there thinking like, well, how did that get here? And who communicated this? And what sponsored is this? And how much did they pay? And now all the wheels turn when I go to events on like, how many different parts of the industry have to come together for like one game and like how much work goes into to sport. So it's, it's interesting to see. And I've definitely seen it over through like my own experiences. It's just going to the game as a fan and having a great night with my dad. And then now, now going and still having a great time, but really realizing and, and studying the industry, how much goes on. So I think that's really cool how we can maximize the amount of, uh, sponsors and and what you can see on the boards just by like that one little one little adjustment that's going to be uh, on TV now. So it's really interesting. Hey, listen, if there's one thing that I I hope and I I mentioned this a couple of times in my sponsorship class is that at the end of the day I want you to think that, like you you hopefully you're going to think differently you know when you watch an ad on Super Bowl or in the hockey game or on or rationalize or ask the questions that you're asking Madeline. And, on why are they doing this, right? Why why is this brand on a rink board? Why is this brand in an advertisement during the game? Why is this brand doing something special in a grocery store, right, around sports? Like all of these things are sponsorship related and 
glad to hear it's starting to have an impact. I don't want you to lose your enjoyment of the game because that's paramount. But now, now as sports, as sports business professionals, we all have our, our hats on. We think a little bit differently. Exactly. Yeah. And as you mentioned, this, this um, NHL like um, board deal almost took about six years. So could you maybe expand on the process from like, like start to finish on how you close a sponsorship deal in the industry and, you know, like what goes into to prospecting and all the way to like signing that final deal and, and getting it going. Yeah. Listen, I, I mean, there's so much that goes into it. I mean, I could sit here and talk for an hour on it easily, but you know, I'll first say that, you know what, the mindset of sponsorship has, has evolved um, again, as I've outlined a little bit in class, just that it's not about sponsorship. It's really about partnership. It's about two two organizations coming together with some and trying to find mutual goals that are going to help each other and, uh, and help a brand specifically who's going to invest in that. So, you know, you need to figure out a way to, to find brands like that. You have to do your homework, right? You have to stay in the know and what's going on in the industry. Like I spent literally the first half hour to hour of every day, reading news stories, seeing what's going on in the world, seeing what's happening in sports, seeing what happened last night, like, things like that, that I, I can walk into work and actually have an education on kind of what's going on in the world and in the world of sports. But, you know, for, for us and for me, as far as going to, to market, you know, listen, every, every property like the NHL or NFL, NBA, the Leafs, the Raptors, you know, the River Lions, wherever it happens to be, everybody's got a list of kind of targets and they have brands or categories they want to target. So the first element is really about prospecting and finding out who it is that you want to talk to and that you want to do business with, right? So, you know, the NHL, we've got a number of categories that are open right now that I'd love to chase and, and figure out, and they're priorities to me. And then I'm going to figure out what brands are in there. So ultimately, I have to do a little bit of home uh, homework. And then I'm going to find out how do I bring us and these brands or categories together. And by doing that, you know what? I'm going to try and find a partnership that's going to make sense. So prospecting would be the first part, right? And doing your homework and figuring out who you want to talk to. The second part of that is actually qualifying is like figuring out, okay, now we know all these brands, but like, I mean, can we do business with them? Are they spending money? Are they involved in sponsorship? You know, do they have some interest? You know, is anything that we have potentially link up with what's going on in their world? And that's again, part of the homework you have to do. And when you get to that place and you finally get an opportunity to talk to someone at a brand or an agency that's representing whoever it is you want to talk to, end of the day, then now you got to find out if there's a fit. So I'd say the third piece is a needs assessment. You need to go through and understand and listen to what brands are doing, what they're, what they're trying to accomplish, what their objectives are, and then start to tick off in your brain and you know, the check, check the boxes on, oh, okay, we can maybe help them with this and we can help them with that. And you start to hear, our demos are similar, you know, our, and audiences are similar, you know, our, our strategies on what we're trying to do in the market are kind of similar, right? We've got things that can marry up with each other because we both have an interest in them, like things like that, that just allow you to get a little bit deeper. And when you do that, then all of a sudden you start to qualify, you further qualify that prospect and go, okay, now we're at a place where I think we can do something together. But the key is to learn a lot about who it is you want to do business with. Now, after you're done that, you know, you got to continue building relationships with those people, right? It may not go anywhere. You don't want to sit on one brand. You probably want to talk to a bunch of brands in a category so that, you know, you're giving yourself a chance to, to succeed somewhere and use your network again to try and stay in the know and keep that discussion and maybe others going. Um, you know, once that's done and you've figured out objectives and needs, the next part is really the proposal. That's when you've got to come back and go, okay, you've told me a lot about what you want to do. I know the things I think we can, I can bring to you as a partner. And then you present it to them and try and basically weave the story and tie the whole thing together on, you know, here's what I heard. Uh, here's what we do. Here's how I think we can work together. And here are some ideas on how we can and, and start to strategize a little bit on how we think the partnership can work. And that's where you get people excited. You know, you get excited about, okay, I see this, I see the fit or I don't, right? I mean, that's where it could, you know, it continue or it could die. But I mean, that's an important part. You've got to be pretty succinct and, and focused and have a proposal that makes a ton of sense, right? And then after that, you know what? Listen, you're going to negotiate. You're going to have objections. You're going to need to give them more insight and do some more work together to make them 
comfortable and get them the information that they need to make a decision. So, you know, that's, that's hand, that handholding goes on throughout the partnership and even after the partnership's even closed, but you know, and the closing's the end is like, at the end, you get to a place where you find a bunch of things you want to do together. You've got an idea of the terms that you want to have, how long you want to partner for, how much money you're willing to pay, what's in a deal, what assets and inventory are included to try and meet all these objectives. And then, you know, you, uh, I joke, then you you get a free law degree working on contracts and your legal department and understanding everything that goes into trying to put together a deal. Um, and uh, and then you execute it and you do that. I'm part of that. We have a partnership marketing group that takes over relationships that we, we sell into. I maintain a relationship and engagement into that regularly. And we try to keep them happy because I think that's the, you know, I'm talking about achievements. The greatest achievement is having a sponsor that just keeps coming back and renews because you're doing something right. All the things that you worked on trying to do together are coming to fruition and everybody's happy. You know, that's why we have craft for 40 years at the NHL and, you know, we have partners that are longstanding and those, that's, that's the best testament to success is that partners actually want to continue to come back. So, so that follow up the day to day, helping them ideate, strategize, be a part of their business. You know, that's what, ultimately keeps the sponsorship going so that in a nutshell is kind of the the process that at least i look at and try to go through when when we're doing deals yeah and jackson and i last year actually and along with a few other um of our peers we did a um a case study with uh with one of the like a, a large sport organization but we didn't move on but it was the same type of thing and and uh we were basically given a, a list of teams and a, and a list of different avenues that um, this organization didn't have sponsors with. And we had to choose a team and a category and then choose a, a like a brand that fit under that category and why we thought it would all play out. So we kind of had to make our, our own like mini proposal for a sponsorship and, and try to sell it to them. So it was really cool experience because we got to do it from our end and I mean, it was very small scale. We didn't actually have to reach out to anybody, but it's it's really cool experience to get to do that. No, and listen, I think the more experience you can have on that, you know, the better served you're going to be in getting into a sales role or even the marketing role that's going to be on the brand side and trying to figure out how you're going to do stuff with it, right? It's it's really, really paramount. So, I mean, that's my MO with regards to approach to my class and real world examples and real world kind of know-how on what happens and what to expect and what you should be thinking about and doing it. Hopefully that will serve you well. And sounds awfully familiar then to the assign the last assignment in my class this year. A little bit because Madeline, I was thinking the exact sounds same example. I was thinking the exact same example. I'm like this sounds like the case study. So like we got, we got it in a little mini scale, nothing like you had to do. So I'm sure yours take a lot longer than what I think ours was like, a week and a half of preparation. So I'm sure yours is a lot longer than that as well. So, <laughs> um, and then as well on the SPEMA council podcast, we like to talk about some like real life stuff and some sports talks. So we're going to um, transition into that. Um, so my first question is just like, so what was the most rewarding deal that you've ever closed in your career? It might've been something that you were very passionate about, or maybe like you closed a deal with a, like a celebrity that like you got to meet or something like that. So like, what was just like the most like rewarding deal in your opinion that you've closed? Well, listen, I, I, you never forget your first. So at the end of the day, like I remember I did a deal with Moosehead for the NBA um, that we did for a couple of years that uh, I was really proud of because it was the first deal I ever did and uh, incorporated a number of assets. It was a lot of learning on my, on my side to try and uh, to try and make that deal happen and bring it together. My beer experience at Labatt didn't hurt that. That helped me. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, that was a win. You know, I'd say I probably have one from at least one from each the leagues I've been in. Like, you know, I did an enormous deal with uh, with Quiznos when I was at the NFL uh, that that I was really really proud of. As well as um, there's a program called Take a Player to School at the NFL, which continues to this day, and that. Uh, that I tried to help evolve when I was there and into I suppose the one national write-in program, it became four, four contests or promotions across the country with each of Rogers sports. And that's four, uh, four regional territories. And uh, we did it, we did it in conjunction with geographically with teams that were in those areas. So the Pacific one was lined up with someone from the Seahawks, the, uh, the one in, um, in the prairies or sports net West was married up with uh 
the Vikings, uh, the Bills uh, are kind of in the mix on that. Ontario, obviously, with the Bills. And then out east uh, with the Patriots. So, um, and we have all of that into something that lived on Sportsnet that was brought to life. We included Play 60 into it. And uh, we had some unbelievable uh, experiences and, and award winners. Um, you know, we had Golden Tate uh, when he was with the Seahawks, participated at West. George Wilson, who was a safety for the Bills for a number of years, a really, really charitable and philanthropic guy who's just a fantastic, uh, fantastic ambassador for the Bills and for the program. And uh, most notably, we had Rob Gronkowski go to the Mirror Machi to uh, to award a prize winner. And uh, we had the whole mayor, the mayor came out, the whole town was out. Um, and uh, the, the actual program really, really made a difference. So that was memorable. And, uh, you know, here at the NHL, listen, my first year was Kellogg. And I'm proud of that because it's gone. It still lives eight years later um, after that I did it. That was my first deal in my first four or five months when I was here. And that's evolved Tony into, you know, great plays of the night, Tony, the tiger and, and uh, engagement at shelf. You see NHL, Tony and Tony, the tiger in an NHL uniform on every, in every box of frosted flakes. Um, so that lives on. And, uh, you know, one other one I'd say would be Clorox. I did a North American deal with Clorox two and a half years ago now, just with the pandemic and, you know, the, just the, the notoriety for doing something that's going to help not only, our game, our players, our NHL clubs and their staff, you know, in executing games and feeling some level of confidence and having Clorox be a part of the disinfecting and cleaning of, of dressing rooms and benches and things like that, but then extend that to fans when they started to come back to buildings that we thought it was a really, and I, I truly believe it was a very impactful partnership just because, you know, it tried to address a need in the market and, and building fans confidence and, and everyone's confidence about a return to hockey on any level, like be it in a bubble or when we started to get back to fans. So, so those are, those are ones that kind of sit at the top of my list with regards to rewarding and satisfying. That's, that's so true that you always remember your first, your first one, because this summer I, I worked in a sales role and I remember the, First, it was like one of the first phone calls I made. It was like my boss said, okay, you guys have had enough training this week. You can hop on the phone this afternoon. And I remember I called and, and this, this gentleman picked up and I like tried to get him to buy some tickets and he said, okay. And he like bought the package and I was sitting there on the phone, like looking at my manager going like, what, what do I do? Like I, I wasn't expecting him to say yes so fast. So it's true. I, I phoned my parents as soon as I got in the car. I said, listen, I made my first calls today. I got my first sale. So that's always awesome. memorable. But <laughs> um, yeah, but um, one of my bucket list items with my dad is to visit uh, every NHL arena and watch the Leafs play. Um, and one of my roommate, actually, she's done this with her dad already. And we didn't know this before we moved in together. But She's visited every NHL arena um, to watch Leafs play. I That's my goal with my dad in my lifetime, I've said. So I want to know your opinion. What's your favorite NHL arena? That's a good question. Well, I know what one was probably going to be my favorite, but I haven't been there yet. And I was supposed to go and then COVID shot it down was the opening of the Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle. Mm -hmm. I've just heard unbelievable things about that and the commitment to the Climate Pledge and Amazon has and what they've done with the building being basically, you know, uh, net zero as far as approach to the environment um, is, is incredible, but I haven't been there. So I can't say that that is my favorite. Um, that's a really good question though. You know, I, uh, I have a big heart. One of my favorite ones was, I mean, listen, the Buffalo auditorium was probably the craziest place I've ever seen a game. Just the, you feel like you could fall down to the ice from the top level based on how steep it was and how, how rickety it was and everything <laughs> else there. So that was uh, that was really unique. Uh, but you know what? If I was to say where, honestly, I I really love Nashville. I think Nashville has got. First of all, I'm a country music fan, so that doesn't hurt. But uh, the fans are rabid. The town is into it. Um, you know, we went there this year for Stadium Series and played in front of 65, 70 thousand people, and uh, and you could not go a block without seeing a ton of. Tampa Bay jerseys and Nashville jerseys and that people celebrate the game, but in there is just so much fun uh, and they just have a good time and people rally around it, you know, but there's so many great places. And if you haven't been to the Madeline, you know, I'd say a couple, 
I'd say Vegas is really high on the list. That's a really great place to see a hockey game. You could you know, have a couple of beers, watch some hockey and roll into the nightclub at the top of the building if you want to after. Right. It's uh, that's incredible. You can go to Columbus and get your ears blown out with a cannon every time they score. And at an all star game when there's 11 and 12 and 13 goals, that gets old real fast. But it's, uh, you know, every every place has its charm, which you'll soon find out as you get there, just like it is going here in Toronto and, you know, hearing the hockey song and all the, the stuff that's you know, you come to expect when you go to a Leafs game. But, yeah, you know, I, I'll put Nashville up there at the top as far as places that I love to go. We, no. we really want to go to Nashville, but I don't think my mom and my sister, my mom and my sister won't let my dad and I go without them. So they'll have to be invited for that trip. <laughs> <laughs> no, and like, even, like, I think Nashville is pretty cool. I haven't been yet. Um, but like, even I think it was about like, over the last couple of years, you keep hearing people talk about how cool Nashville is, how great Nashville was. And like my parents, big country music fans, so like they listen to the highway on like Sirius XM. And like, it was like a couple of years ago, you started hearing like, oh yeah, we're here for the, like the hockey game as well. Like it's so like, it's even like just creating like a brand as well. Like down there, like it's a oh, totally. big time atmosphere. Nashville's a hockey town, by the way. Like it's a great Titans town. There's no doubt, but it is a hockey town. And I'll tell you, Vegas is a hockey town, regardless to the Raiders, because Vegas, the, the Golden Knights were in there first. And if you remember back, uh, to when they launched, there was a real tragedy with the Route 66 event um, and the shootings that happened. And the opening for Vegas was really somber, but they grew deep roots because of all the great things and the way they handled the situation. And listen, the club has committed to being Vegas style, right? Like they brought in Cirque du Soleil. They, like, they really dialed it up and, uh, and fans gravitate to it. And you know what? It's awesome because a ton of people love to travel on the road and go see their favorite team in Vegas. So you get a good smattering of, uh, of fans from the other team, but they're strong. They're committed. It's a great venue. It's a great area. They created a great buzz around the area. As you walk off Las Vegas Boulevard and park past the park hotel, like it's, it's, you feel the vibe from the moment you get out of a cab or you walk up. It's uh, it's a fantastic place to see a game. No, for sure. Well, this has been awesome from myself and Madeline. We'd like to thank you for coming on. Um, and as we do in every episode, we always let the guests have the floor at the end. So any final comments, thoughts, and again, thank you for coming on this episode. No, thank you Thanks, for having George, me. Really and listen, like, my pleasure, Madeline. And, and listen, like, I, I'm really proud to say I'm teaching at Brock and a uh, great group of people and great group of students so far. The program is obviously unique. Really proud of the fact that this is one of the few, I think one of two universities that offer a sports sponsorship program so in canada that i'm uh, i'm really proud at least a course story in in the program um that i'm really proud to be a part of and uh listen doing this is important and uh and i really you know giving back and doing things and you'll all probably take this forward with your like, as you move forward and know that you wish people could help you more and give you insight and you get stuff like this like stuff like this never happened for me way back and having this ability to engage with students and people is awesome and if anybody has questions or wants to reach out like feel free send me a note reach out on linkedin uh happy to try and connect and uh and try to help in any way that i can moving forward perfect again thank you so much thank you all the best have a great day